subscribing and leaving comments. Von Koningwald's find. 
Gigantopithecus was erect, uh, it was bipedal, primate, uh, with strong, broad shoulders, uh, standing erect, 8 to 10 feet in height, is a uh, guest. And uh, weighing between 6 and 1,000 pounds, is also a guest. Well, they were likely to have been vegetarians, perhaps even opportunistic meat eaters, though lacking the claws and fangs of regular carnivores. Could the Sasquatch be a descendant of Gigantopithecus? It would seem that the available fossil record would point to the likelihood. Though to date, evidence suggesting that Gigantopithecus inhabited North America has not surfaced. At one time, a land bridge between Siberia and North America existed, and it's therefore quite conceivable that the same route was used for the Sasquatch to infiltrate North American wilderness just as the uh, earlier uh, hominids, uh, hominids did. Well, the Sasquatch indeed fits a parallel description of Gigantopithecus of long ago with respective ratios of general morphology. The proven existence of a Sasquatch would be invaluable to physical anthropologists. It's very parallel with that line of work. The, in whether or not that the Sasquatch biologically originated from more of a uh, ponder hominid line, specifically, but how this it would be described would possibly even open up an entirely new field of study within anthropology. Biologically, the Sasquatch would be of probably anatomical interest in relation to the possible similarities of the vital organs, uh, reproductive system, digestive system, and if the Sasquatch would be looking uh, Sasquatch being man's possible closest uh, relative, uh, which indeed would have to be predetermined, uh, would also be a possible candidate for study on uh, its intellectual capabilities. Uh, medically, would be a far better subject for cancer research, disease testing, uh, AIDS research, and other health hazards plaguing man than a rat or a monkey would. And zoologically, I think much could be learned from observation of the behavior and mental capacity of a Sasquatch thus also serving an even greater educational purpose. Therefore, it is quite conclusive that just one dead Sasquatch simply would not quench man's insatiable thirst for knowledge. The scientific, medical, and educational pertinence would warrant collecting additional specimens via well-financed and uh, equipped Sasquatch searches, which is something that I think we really lack right now. Nobody's going out there with a well equipped expedition looking for these things or attempting to bag a Sasquatch. It's just not happening. The funds aren't there. The manpower isn't there. And uh, it's just not happening. Philosophical and sociological repercussions, I feel, are as follows. Uh, the vast majority of evidence supporting the existence of the Sasquatch has been rejected by all but a small handful of the scientific community. Uh, for example, footprints showing Dermal Ridge and sweat pores found in Washington State in 1982 were proclaimed authentic by fingerprint experts who said that it would be impossible to fake markings so accurately. But yet we have substantial documentation and reason to believe they're fake. And it's become quite a controversial subject, which really doesn't do any of us any good. Even hairs found in 1987 in Colorado were sent to Dr. Gerald Lowenstein, a biochemist at San Francisco, who concluded that the hairs were from a higher primate unknown to modern science. Well, the list goes on, and it, and it, and it seems to be, uh, this, you know, the same, the circle just seems unbroken. And it really doesn't bring us any closer to collecting a Sasquatch. It's all very interesting, and it's all very uh, nice to properly document uh, what little physical evidence we can obtain at sighting locations or perhaps in prime zones where the creatures have been seen, because that's what cryptozoology is supposed to be about, documenting and, and as much as we can, you know, evidence from uh, undiscovered uh, animals. But in our society, we're thought uh, and brought up being told that monsters, giants, and unusual animals are found only in dreams and storybooks. But the repercussions of the formal discovery of a Sasquatch, I feel, would raise philosophical and social issues in a society where ecological conservation has become fashionable. Wildlife protection groups 
uh, the National Wildlife Federation, and other groups would enthusiastically attempt to have the creatures listed as an endangered species and promote legislation to introduce a bill protecting them. As far as I know, the large body of data that we have accumulated over the years regarding Sasquatch reports has not contained any specific reasoning to suggest that these animals are extinct or endangered in any way. Yet, wildlife activists would undoubtedly promote such disingenuous assumptions. Simply, the Sasquatch would be the most man-like looking animal known to exist. And promoting the protection of such creatures, I feel, is more of a concern for the philosophical protection of mankind than it is any animal. True, the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest uh, has carried more of a gentle giant's uh, image over the years, yet the Sasquatch in the East seems to have more of a swamp monster image. And one thing I've noticed uh, over the years in interviewing hundreds of witnesses in different states around the country is that they all seem to have a genuine concern for the Sasquatch. Uh, whether it's categorized as human or animal, they simply don't feel that the creature should be destroyed out of mankind's fear or for the betterment of mankind's wanderlust. But scientifically, this is impractical. Yet very, very few scientists go into the bush. And uh, this, I think, has become quite a problem. They seem to wait for us to bring hair, blood, and feces to them, and if ultimately a body. And uh, the way I feel about it, you know, most of them do not really know anything about the Sasquatch. You know, in due respect to, you know, the academic community, uh, the, the, the scientists just aren't going out into the bush for extended periods of time like the investigators are. And we've, I've talked with many, uh, many of you in the room over the, the weekend about this. And uh, I've got some conclusions at the end of my presentation here uh, that, that I feel are some, just some suggestions on maybe how we can uh, get, get the whole thing together. The Sasquatch's formal discovery and classification would also definitely induce mass commercialism uh, of the species. For example, it's not premature to predict that perhaps a well-funded zoo, uh, such as the San Diego Zoo, would offer a substantial monetary figure for the live capture and sale of a Sasquatch for exhibition, or perhaps a uh, large corporate structured service like Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, uh, would also bid for a Sasquatch for public entertainment. And uh, all the t-shirts, hats, and programs could be sold right along with it. And uh, if we are to use, uh, you know, these predictions are really not impossible if we are to use the gorilla as a prime example. After Du Chaillu's scientific lecture with the gorilla in the mid-1800s, the gorilla's exhibitionalistic value and commercial marketability fell into its proverbial place. And now the gorillas are on cartoons and, you know, uh, you can buy a little stuffed gorilla for your little granddaughter and, you know, gorilla comic books and it's very comical. But when the gorilla was formally discovered and, and zoologically classified in the mid-1800s, it was a thing of horror. It was the ugliest uh, thing, thing to date. Public concern for the safety and protection from such beasts uh, would indeed create a small-scale panic in prime Sasquatch population zones. Man has long had the internal need to feel superior over a natural environment whose real dangers are more of an impending reality than fear of things that go bump in the night. The reality of the existence of Sasquatches uh, in our deep forests, swamps, and woodlands would be probable cause for a sudden drop in hunting and camping trips, park visits, hikes, and fishing trips. Again, it may seem uh, a bit presumptuous, but man's fear of the unknown often outweighs his uh, curiosity. And the proven existence of an animal much larger than man anatomically a higher primate having more intelligence than perhaps a grizzly bear, and perhaps even being just as dangerous if provoked, uh, would keep many an outdoorsman out of the bush. However, I feel it would also uh, introduce a new group of, of folks that would start going to the bush. And uh, I say that uh, in reference to uh, the weekend thrill seekers and perhaps even the, uh, you know, attracting a, a whole new breed of outdoorsmen who would attempt to replace a head-mounted grizzly or bull elk at the head of a Sasquatch for the living room wall. Well, a representative uh, from the Coleman Company, longtime manufacturers of camping equipment and accessories, echoed these sentiments. 
who told me that he believes that the company would see a definite temporary loss in sales and interest in recreation uh, in prime Sasquatch population zones, should one be formally discovered, until more information about the Sasquatch was made available to the public. And I really think those remarks hold merit. It is certainly unlikely that the Sasquatch will ever be proven to exist by way of a live specimen. Logistically, there aren't any well-financed, properly equipped expeditions searching uh, North America's uh, wilderness areas for extended periods of time. With all but formal rejection of fascinating physical evidence by the scientific community, uh, the search is left to cryptozoologists, whose goals are sometimes geared more towards pursuing each other rather than the undiscovered animal. And the circle remains unbroken. Bones or a partial skeleton will not suffice, would suffice. Uh, however, it would also be subject to scientific scrutiny. The only practical and logical means of collecting a Sasquatch specimen for proper zoological classification would be to obtain a body or part of a body. It just doesn't seem ethical to, uh, or perhaps even morally unjustifiable, to kill hundreds of thousands of deer every year. Grizzly bears, well, grizzlies are protected now, but black bears uh, in some parts of the country you can still hunt. Why would it seem any more unethical to attempt to kill an alleged Sasquatch? The possible scientific, medical, and educational relevance seems uh, would, be, would be more imperative uh, in relation to anthropological, biological, and zoological pertinence. And I feel that collecting a Sasquatch specimen for uh, proper scientific description would be significant to the aforementioned fields of study. The educational benefits, should one ever be obtained, would indeed be tenfold. But what I think, I think we need to do is we as amateur and professional cryptozoologists, if that's the proper term you like to use uh, or not, I think we need to reflect upon our own goals and purposes. All the hair samples in the world now aren't going to do us any good anymore. Finding tracks aren't, aren't, aren't impressive anymore. Sightings, as John Green mentioned in yesterday's presentation, uh, aren't impressive anymore. It's just another sighting. You know, and, and we would expect that. We would hope that there'll be sightings two years from now at this time. I think that what we need to do is ask ourselves, are we aiding in the scientific research or, and, or, eminent collection of a Sasquatch, or are we vastly becoming a collective bunch of weekend thrill seekers? I feel it is imperative that what we need to do is those researchers and investigators involved in uh, the Sasquatch search and perhaps members of the scientific community who have taken a serious look at the Sasquatch problem uh, alike need to take a more serious look at the Sasquatch enigma and incorporate stricter guidelines that would be far more conducive to collecting a specimen. I think that it would be very, very sad if this all went on for another 20 years with just 20 years more of the documentation of footprints, hair, and, and, uh, and sighting reports. Uh, more books on the subject that really, uh, you know, aren't any more impressive than the books that were written 10 and 15 years ago. And I, I just feel that uh, we need to, to uh, incorporate perhaps some kind of stricter guidelines that would at least be far more conducive to collecting a specimen. Now, I have talked with several other people, uh, different victim investigators around the country, who feel that collecting a Sasquatch by killing it uh, would be very detrimental to the creature's uh, existence and well-being. I can't offer any, any possible opinion on that other than my own. I, I don't have the background or, or uh, perhaps, you know, feelings to, you know, to, to look at in any other way than, than how I would feel about it. But as I said earlier in, in, the, in the paper, I think that it's pretty obvious that killing just one Sasquatch so it can be dissected and photographed and stuck all over the media and stuck in a museum six months later, it's not going to stop there. And I think what we need to do, you know, it's, it's all fine and fun and games and stuff to go out as much as we can to where there have been sightings of the creatures and where there have been uh, folks who have reported them and, and found tracks before, perhaps some of us have found tracks ourselves, and, and that's all very exciting, but what is it really getting us? What are we really going to do about it in the future? Are we going to take a more serious look at it and, and, and try and incorporate 
uh, different means that haven't worked in the last 20 or 30 years? Are we going to try and work together? Which, which, which at this point would seem very impossible due to the fragmentation of Bigfooters around the country. Or are we going to uh, just become a collective bunch of weekend thrill seekers? If everyone in this room who is a, a Bigfoot investigator would think back to the, what was the first thing that made you want to go check out that sighting report or say, yeah, I'm going to go down and meet those folks or sightings have been over here, you know, not too far away. I want to go down there and look around a little bit. It, it seems very much that Sasquatch Search is an adventure. It's a mystery. It's intriguing. And finding evidence of undiscovered animals is exciting, whether it be the Sasquatch or, or uh, any other perhaps undiscovered animals that are, that are out there. I attended the uh, ISC conference last year in Maryland, and in my opinion, you, Dr. Eugenie Clark's presentation on new species of sharks was just simply fascinating. And I very much like the whole idea of cryptozoology and uh, what it stands for, but I think we really need to, to uh, some of the people that are doing other fields of study other than on the Sasquatch are really, are really making headway. Every time there's a photograph of a Sasquatch found or taken or, or surfaces, it's out of focus, it's too far away, the picture's too dark, you know. The tracks are under constant scrutiny, uh, Dermal Ridge or not, whether they're tracks that were found last month, like I did in southern Ohio, uh, that are 17 and a half inches long. I found 50 tracks with a five and a half to six foot striding between them. And, uh, you know, it, it's getting to a point, I think, where all of us around the country, and there are many, many investigators around the country, really need to at least, even, at least keep the data flowing which is why we published the newsletter, uh, to keep abreast of current sightings and to at least continue to properly document the evidence. But we just really need to ask ourselves, what is documenting the evidence really going to do for us? What has it done for us so far, and what about the future? I think that's very, very important. Thank you. Yes, well, I agree with you that it's getting redundant, that people are just saying, well, I found tracks and sightings are recorded. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I think if it can be studied in a systematic way, including studying the hair and saying, is it real hair, is it bare hair, I'm trying to eliminate these things, then maybe you can find a pattern. And it seems unless you do document these things, however redundant, you're never going to find a pattern that's going to allow you to anticipate where they might be, assuming you're territorial. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. I, I very much agree with that. I would rather go into an area where there have been repeated sightings than just pick one place in the middle of Hoosier or Wayne National Forest and say, well, this looks good, let's just go here. You know, I agree with that. If you can document the evidence properly and, and uh, get back analytical reports that, that confirm that we don't know what the hair is from or we don't know what, you know, uh, this this blood or, or is, is from or we can identify the proteins in a species sample that is very exciting still and uh, maybe it'll let you know let us know that maybe something was genuinely there so I agree with that I agree with that yes so we also need to educate the media better so that they know what sort of value if any to place upon outrageous skeptical claims we need to clean our yes. own house of things they completely the agree. comes along and says, I can go up in the woods and crush off some stuff off the ground with my hand. I can duplicate a big foot track. It's up to us to say, okay, I have a video camera. I can do it. And then cast it and see how it compares and how it right. doesn't compare. There are too many armchair skeptics who are getting a lot of press. The idea is it will not yes. see the actuality, but unless we pin them down, Unless we do the work that they don't do, we're in no position to complain about what the press does to us as they did this morning. Exactly. But the, the bad part of it, uh, on the other hand also, is that you've got a lot of these uh, Bigfooters that are out in left field getting so much publicity. It's getting disgusting. I'm sorry, but, you know, the, you know, the psychic love vibes from the Sasquatch and the Bigfoot comes from UFOs. 
and will pick up uh, Elvis and fly off, you know, and land at the bottom of Loch Ness. And I'm not talking about tabloid stuff. I'm talking about a handful of investigators around this country that are constantly in the media, constantly on radio and TV, promoting this kind of stuff. And the sad part is that the general public who are just interested in Bigfoot believe it. Well, they believe that these people know what they're talking about, and they don't. Well, here we've got to educate the science editors of the yes, we do. responsible media, the New York Times. That's right. And we need to educate the media. And again, that was another reason for me deciding to put this international newsletter together. I felt that uh, there was another Bigfoot newsletter out there that I felt was just kind of going downhill and not keeping abreast of current sightings and publishing factual information. And uh, there are, matter of fact, several members of the media, uh, reporters and, and uh, press services that, that get this thing. And the reason is that we can at least, I mean, my God, if I'm going to open up the newspaper or, or a magazine, uh, such as Science Digest or Science Frontiers or, or whatnot. I don't care if it's People Magazine. At least if, it, if there's a Bigfoot story in there, I want it to be factual information. And I completely agree that we do need to educate the media on uh, the backgrounds of some of these uh, left field investigators. Yes? Um, I need to say something about the reaction. I, I I would like to see myself as a sort of peacemaker among the factions. Of course, I'd love to be. Um, I lived for seven months in Teresa Smokey's time. I did not believe in telepathy before I lived with Teresa Smokey's straightforward PhD. It's all nice, straight scientific research. I came back from the island to the chairman of my department and said, I know you're going to think I'm flaky, but can we just talk about something? I believe, I'm not saying this scientifically, I believe the monkeys taught me about telepathy. I became telepathic. Now, that's, I'm scared to say that, all of the anger here against anybody that says anything psychic. But I'm trying to say scientifically that that happens to me. And so I said to him, yeah, don't you, don't you agree that if there is such a thing as telepathy, and if this exists among primates, then it's incredibly important in their social structure. If it exists, yes. Sure. Observation of what you're saying. 
talk about killing an animal and the emotion that's constantly raised about it. You need to sacrifice a specimen in order to save the population. Sacrifice a specimen. You've got to save a yeah. city by killing one of the citizens. I'm sorry, but somebody's going to go. Yeah, I agree with that. Protection would be if, in fact, Bigfoot exists. And I'm not doing that in the at all. What I'm saying is if, in fact, it exists, you would have instantaneous protection after one animal was shot and somebody take a hell of a lot of heat for shooting the animal. Right. But you probably would be responsible for saving the population if indeed it exists. Very true. And you get protection of forces there is that are not protected. Sasquatch right off. 
that, that would be my objective. I, that's my own personal feeling. If you're not going, there's nothing you can do. I don't. I think it would have been done a long time ago if a, if a Sasquatch was going to be brought in alive. The, the early attempts early on in this thing uh, just, just proved fruitless. And I think that it's, it's going to be a deer hunter or perhaps a roadside kill uh, that, that, that's going to end this whole thing. Yes, Dan? Where would you look? Where would I look? Oh, that would be quite debatable because with, with the unlimited terrain you have here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And then again with the rash of sightings that have happened in the last 10 years in the eastern United States, we have small, much smaller areas, uh, much more easily accessible, that have had repeated sightings over years and years and years. And perhaps somewhere in the eastern United States might be a very good place logistically to, to, to search or, or to carry out something like that. Okay, we'll have to stop the question at this point. We could have gone on forever. Yes, sir. Uh, I think we got quite a bit out. Okay. Now, our next figure... Uh, if you're enjoying all this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.